This is a neural network, and the first time I learned about them, I felt pretty cheated. I was told neural networks are general function approximators, but apparently what I thought they meant by a general function approximator was very far from what neural networks are. In this video I want to show you the project that I worked on four years ago to try and create a universal function approximator that works very differently from regular neural networks. When I first heard the term general function approximator, I imagined an algorithm that takes a few pieces of data and returns a function that approximates this piece of data. I mean a mathematical function with mathematical operators like multiplication, division and so on. But instead with neural networks I get a mess of 10 million metrics multiply that I just have nothing to do with, I can't understand it. So I asked myself, can we create a machine learning model that uses mathematical operators instead of neural networks? So about four years ago, I spent a day trying to tackle this problem. And I think I ended up creating a pretty cool proof of concept. But I mean, it was four years ago, so the code is not perfect. But if I'll get a hundred comments saying you wouldn't judge me for the code, I would open source this repository. The idea of the project was to represent functions as trees of operators, and then use evolution to create a better and better representation of the training set using those mathematical operators. But to be able to evolve functions, there are three questions we need to answer very clearly. The first one is how do we define the structure of the function? The second one is how do we mutate this function across generations? And the last one is how do we evaluate how good is this function at solving the particular problem we give it? Let's start with the first question, defining the function's structure. That's gonna be pretty easy. As I showed before, we can represent any mathematical expression as a tree a tree of the operators and constants of that expression. The second question was about mutating those trees. And this is where it gets interesting, as getting a good enough mutation to be able to slowly approach a better and better approximation of the function using evolution alone requires a pretty complex set of rules that I will go over now. So there are four rules allowing us to approach the right function. The first and simplest rule is that we can choose a random constant and then either increase or decrease its value. The next rule is that any node can be deleted and replaced by another randomly generated tree. And the, the next tree can be just any length, any size, with any operators. The next rule is that we can just delete a node and deleting a node is done by setting this node to be equal to one of its children. And the last rule is that if all of the children of a node are either constants or operators, but not x, this node would have the chance to be simplified to the value resulting from the expression of his subtree. And about evaluating how good a function is, that's going to be very close to evaluating the loss of a neural network. We can just take the dataset, pass it through our function to get a prediction for each point in the dataset, calculate the difference between each point in the dataset and the prediction, then combine all of those differences to get the measurement of how bad this function is. But actually only doing this would lead to the same problem with neural networks as the functions themselves are going to start being huge. To solve this, we can calculate another term for each function, which is its complexity, which is basically the numbers of nodes in the tree, and add this term to the loss to prioritize cleaner, smaller functions. So I made this little web UI and we can actually start playing with it. We can input the inputs and outputs, which in this simple case, I just wanted it to approximate x squared plus one. So zero would turn into one, one would turn into two, three would turn into 10 and so on. 
we can set the population size for the evolution simulation. I would set it to a thousand and we can let it run for a thousand generations. I also added this complexity term and the higher we set this term, the more complex the functions will be and the less we are going to punish them for being large. But for now, two would be a good value. And death probability is what percentage of the population we would kill each generation and let the others reproduce. We can press run and almost instantly get a pretty good approximation. We can see a chart showing the dataset versus the prediction, which in this case they are almost the same. Here we see a small chart showing the distribution of losses of the best functions. And down below there is a list of the best functions. And we can see it's already extremely close to the actual answer. This algorithm currently is not prioritizing integers, so it just would get infinitely closer to one, but it probably wouldn't reach actually one. Oh, it did reach actually one. Okay, yeah. So that's just floating point uh, precision not being infinite. <laughs> we can also let it try to approximate some really, really weird functions, like turning zero into one, one into zero, 3 into 10 and 5 into 0. And again, we can just run it and see what happens. And again, pretty quickly, it's doing a pretty good approximation. But actually, this run would not be able to converge to the actual function because we set the complexity term too low and it tries to make very simple functions while you would need a pretty complex functions to do it. So we can just change the complexity term from something like 2 to something like 5 and run it again, and it probably would do a much better job now. And here we already found a function that is almost exact. And of course, the longer we let it run, it's going to produce better and better functions. If you want to come out and implement algorithms like this one yourself, you need to first have a very solid problem-solving foundation. And if you want to practice your problem-solving skills and improve for free today, I would recommend the sponsor of this video, Brilliant. Brilliant makes you better at thinking and problem-solving, with thousands of visual interactive lessons in math, science, programming, data analysis, and AI. Brilliant doesn't just let you watch video lectures, it lets you play with concepts and build your understanding from the ground up. It would help you build critical thinking skills, not by memorizing concepts, but by letting you solve problems. Learning just a little bit more every day is extremely important, both to your personal and professional life, and Brilliant helps you make a habit out of it. With Brilliant, you start with the fundamentals, but you can reach really serious learning goals. Wherever you are, you can learn on the go with Brilliant. So go to brilliant.org slash galahat and start learning for free today. And if you use my link, you even get 20% off on the annual subscription. Now let's get back to the video. Let's talk for a moment about some limitations of this implementation. The first obvious one is that currently it only supports one input and one output. So we can't train models on images, audio, or things like that, or even simple multi-variable problems. But this can easily be solved if I just continue to work on this and make a second version that supports uh, multiple inputs and multiple outputs. The second problem is a bit more nuanced. Let's see what happens if we give it an extremely difficult task. Like, the inputs are going to be just numbers from 1 to 25, but the outputs would return 0 for a non-prime number and 1 for numbers that are prime. Now let's give it a sufficiently large population like 10,000 and run it for 10,000 generations, so we will be sure that if there is a solution, it would find it. And let's increase the complexity to something like 13, so even non-elegant solutions would be accepted. And now, let's just let it run for a long, long time.
Now, we can see that the solution is not that good at all. And it's not because the task was too complicated. Let me show you why it is. Let's take a look at this function and plot it in a graphing calculator. We can see that it's the type of function that makes your computer crash, that it's almost random in most of the points, and it's just by chance that the integer points we chose align with prime numbers on those patterns. But for evolution to work well, we need small changes in the input to result in small changes in the output. And the jumps between points here is just too big. It's too sensitive for small changes, so the mutations become ineffective. We can solve this by adding a penalty for high entropy functions, functions that have regions of almost infinite frequency, and functions with extreme derivatives. I would genuinely and personally really recommend you to check out Brilliant, as you can start out for free, really for free, and the amount of benefit you can get for it is really really high. For me, it's just a matter of time until I will come back and revisit this idea, as I find it really really cool and I want to experiment um, by making it better. So subscribe if you want to see that video as well, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.